All right, we're continuing our Soviet and post-Soviet afternoon with a presentation that I've really been particularly looking forward to um, because it's by Irina Sklokina, who is joining us from Lviv in Ukraine. And Irina is someone who I have learned an enormous deal from uh, concerning post-war Soviet commemoration, and especially the Ukrainian case, uh, across many, many interesting exchanges between Lviv, Melbourne, and Manchester. Um, so uh, she's going to talk to us about what is happening in her country right now. And her presentation is about uh, the dignity of the dead in the ongoing war in Ukraine. Irina, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Misha, for the invitation. And of no, course, no. Uh, thank you for organizing this extraordinarily interesting We're not hearing you yet. Event. Hang on. Um, yes, because otherwise we would see that it's muted. I think you need to uh, dial up the channel. Can you say something? Um, yes. So, can you no, hear me now? Still nothing. Now? Can you hear us? No, she can't hear us. I, I, I hear you now. And it's yes. lovely now once again. again. Yes. Is it okay, Is it okay with Dublin? Dublin? Oh, now oh, it's now without it's Dublin. Dublin. So I can go ahead. Okay. So, Gore, why don't you turn off? Yeah? Okay. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, okay super. super. Uh, thank you very much, Misha, for this invitation and, of course, for organizing this extraordinarily uh, interesting and rich event. And uh, thank you for your understanding and invitation to speak via Zoom. Uh, so here I will present uh, just a very first uh, kind of um, brief uh, uh, sketch of this topic. Of course, uh, the war in Ukraine is uh, going on uh, for eight years already. I mean, in the Donbass, and now it just uh, became a full scale in, uh, invasion. And um, um, like uh, much uh, also has changed. Mm, and uh, uh, actually, uh, here I would like to uh, present just a part of uh, uh, what I tried to uh, somehow figure out about the mostly from uh, um, national, so I mean official state uh, news media. Uh, so now under the conditions of the war, we have a kind of uh, several channels united into kind of one uh, national uh, national air, so to say. Mm, and uh, I will uh, try to speak also critically about the kind of Ukrainian, uh, so to say, official and uh, news media approach to, to the topic. And uh, on the other hand, I would like to uh, contrast or uh, to challenge maybe a bit through um, analysis of social networks and also um, uh, one of the most valuable groups of sources for me is uh, oral interviews which are now being collected uh, by the research consortium which is under the process of formation um, actually uh, we at the center for urban history where I work in Lviv um, uh, are now in partnership with several other institutions uh, and we conduct interviews with uh, displaced persons, uh, people from uh, different uh, age and origin, like very diverse group of people who are uh, leaving the uh, areas uh, most affected uh, by the warfare. Uh, so here you can see our partners, so the center uh, and Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, Polish Society for Oral History, University of St. Andrews in the UK, uh, and uh, two institutions from uh, Luxembourg, uh, so the University and Center for Contemporary and Digital History. And uh, I would like to invite uh, all of you who are interested in uh, like voices uh, of the people who 
uh, were affected uh, by this war, uh, please uh, reach out to us and uh, we are, uh, I think, almost ready to share the uh, collection of the recordings uh, because now we went through the ethical commissions and we constantly have, uh, of course, very big ethical discussions in our group about the um, possibilities to interview people uh, on the uh, ongoing conditions and uh, uh, also how we can ethically use and analyze uh, these materials. Mm, but here I will mostly concentrate, um, I think, on analysis of media sphere and all, all only will use oral interviews uh, for uh, contextualization and uh, some kind of insights and explanations of, of uh, what is going on in general in um, information sphere and media sphere in Ukraine. Mm, so, um, first, I would like to uh, say a bit about the context, uh, so for you to understand that the topic of uh, dead bodies and uh, death is not uh, prevalent in the media. Uh, as uh, you can imagine, Ukraine is a fighting uh, country which uh, tries to defend and uh, um, which is seeking uh, like victory in this conflict, uh, is mostly focused on uh, histories of survivors, uh, histories of um, surviving, resistance, and hope, and uh, it's uh, probably also quite uh, natural in this situation. And uh, here I would just like to show you just several examples as uh, our conference um, uh, actually is uh, a part of the series of uh, focused on uh, humans uh, and non-humans, so people, uh, animals and things. Uh, I will um, uh, occasionally refer to uh, different uh, kind of agents, not only people. Uh, so a very typical, I think, uh, in uh, Ukrainian media, uh, you can come across uh, histories of survivors, such as uh, this uh, guy from uh, Chernihiv region, who is telling his uh, uh, history of surviving the mass uh, burial. Also, of course, very symbolic, and I think many of you recognize already um, uh, histories of uh, survival scenes uh, or survival objects uh, and here you can see uh, uh, quite a famous uh, cupboard uh, from uh, uh, multi-storage uh, housing in uh, Borodyanka in uh, Kyiv region and uh, specifically there is a, a ceramic uh, cock uh, which uh, later also became a superstar and was uh, uh, presented to uh, Boris jo Johnson and later sold uh, for the benefit of the Ukrainian army. And uh, of course, also survivor animals, uh, as uh, of course, um, uh, quite typically uh, embodiment uh, of uh, of the resistance and uh, vivality of the whole nation and uh, hope uh, um, for the future. Uh, so, uh, in this uh, context, um, uh, probably you can better imagine the uh, understand that uh, images of death uh, are not uh, actually uh, central. Mm, uh, and uh, there is an attempt uh, to basically somehow psychologically to cope with a, a big number of deaths. And uh, I think uh, we can, uh, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, just also about a couple of other things about the objects also. I think Museum of uh, Grigory Skovarada in Kharkiv region is uh, also uh, very uh, specially photographed and specially uh, branded uh, in media as a case of survival of a sculpture of a philosopher. Uh, so Grigory Skovarada is a very famous uh, philosopher and uh, his museum uh, from 18th century and his uh, museum, was, uh, museum dedicated to him was uh, precisely attacked uh, by the Russian missile. And uh, once again, this image of uh, uh, enlightened philosopher who survived uh, the Russian attack is also very symbolic. And uh, also I think people in social media, just on the grassroots level, they also support this tendency to share stories uh, of uh, survival also through things. And uh, I think this uh, picture is also like super typical for the social networks where people present uh, certain um, nostalgic objects or uh, objects uh, very dear to them as uh, survivors, as uh, kind of victors. And uh, uh, actually, uh, coming back to this uh, 
idea that uh, dead bodies are somehow uh, like very traumatic and uh, uh, very challenging for the uh, national discourse and uh, of course uh, personally for those uh, who uh, who have lost uh, their close ones or of course for everyone who is uh, in this situation now um, uh, under under this uh, um, uh, uh, ongoing uh, war uh, i think uh, most of uh, public discourse is focused on um, the dead enemies bodies not on like our own uh, bodies uh, and um, uh, mostly i would say uh, our own dead are presented in uh, uh, i think uh, religious and uh, community discourses as uh, uh, our heroes who uh, should be given uh, given uh, 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 proper uh, rest and who uh, should be given uh, first of all to the relatives but of course also with participation of the community and the state and um, uh, everywhere in uh, Ukraine and local communities you have these uh, community burials uh, which are uh, attracting like very many uh, very many people mm, uh, but the information about the losses of Ukraine in general is not uh, like super uh, advertised as you can imagine uh, so I think only once um, uh, some weeks ago we had uh, this kind of statistics about that uh, but um, of course uh, there is no kind of generalized picture so um, our dead are individualized are approached as, as humans uh, whereas uh, uh, most uh, attention in the media is given to enemy, enemies' dead bodies. And uh, here I um, tried uh, to uh, sum up uh, like several uh, types uh, of uh, discourses which are uh, present in media. Um, of course, uh, it's a, a legal discourse uh, coupled with the discourse of kind of clash of civilizations uh, and uh, very also typically I think for the war, uh, this idea of uh, care or neglect uh, as a uh, kind of trait uh, of uh, belonging to uh, belonging or not belonging to uh, a kind of progressive and civilized uh, community. Um, also religious uh, discourse, uh, which I think is um, addressing the idea of the dignity most uh, in most obvious way. Also, psychotherapeutic discourse, uh, uh, which is uh, discussing to which extent uh, observing dead bodies or images of dead bodies is healthy or unhealthy, and how it affects, uh, uh, especially all those people who are uh, like living uh, this uh, war through social networks and through you know online experience, mm, and uh, which is also quite typical for for contemporary world and also uh, I uh, include here quite a different type of uh, uh, speaking about the problem as a uh, dark uh, humor and um, shocking content uh, which is uh, quite dominant in certain uh, segments of uh, social media and uh, last but not least ecological discourse once again talking about this human non-human relations i think uh, also uh, this um, uh, positioning of uh, enemies uh, corpses as in uh, ukrainian landscape and uh, in general discussion how it impacts uh, like the nation through its soil uh, uh, it's also quite uh, quite present and obvious mm, so um, speaking about this uh, uh, like legal issues and civility through the corpses. Um, I think you probably also know for, from the news uh, that uh, um, there is uh, this uh, like very much spoken uh, problem of uh, uh, Russians unwilling to uh, take their corpses back, uh, so that uh, they are not interested uh, or they even try to hide uh, the number of the dead and uh, um, for, for different reasons, as it is uh, presented in uh, Ukrainian media, once again, it's uh, um, like uh, Russians uh, who are not willing to pay compensa compensations to their soldiers, uh, or more irrational uh, explanations as uh, uh, Russians being uh, like staying behind the 
civilized community of the like progressive humankind uh, and uh, Russians uh, not sticking to the uh, conventions uh, of the warfare. And uh, here um, uh, some pronouncements from Ukrainian railway. Uh, um, they say they preserve the corpses of the dead Russian soldiers in special refrigerators, but no one uh, like asks uh, for them. And also, I think some uh, international uh, news media also reported uh, similar problems. And I think also such sources as uh, telephone talks of uh, Russian soldiers, they also address uh, this issue. And uh, these talks are quite uh, like present in Ukrainian media here as well. Mm, uh, also, uh, I think... Uh, a uh, quite important contribution uh, into this type of discourses from professional NGOs or other like state organizations working with exhumations. And they are using notions such as disposable soldiers and consumables for Putin uh, to describe uh, the enemy's bodies. And uh, of course, they also highlight uh, that uh, uh, in this war, uh, the international law is not observed. Uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, quite tellingly, uh, in the news media, there are some uh, pronouncements uh, from uh, local residences of the formerly occupied uh, territories who are describing the experience of uh, burying uh, Russian soldiers uh, just for the sanitary reasons. And, uh, and uh, uh, here, once again, we have this uh, references to Western values and uh, uh, memory as a, and individual um, memory as a uh, kind of trait of uh, Western uh, value system to which uh, Ukraine tries to uh, stick now. Um, and uh, also, I think uh, negotiations about the Mm, uh, relatives uh, about the Azov style defenders, so those people who were killed in uh, that very famous big plant in Mariupol. Uh, and uh, this idea that uh, uh, Russians uh, uh, are not willing to give uh, the dead uh, corpses back to the relatives also is a kind of uh, characteristic for, for their uh, value, value system. And uh, talking about the civil victims, uh, once again, uh, they are, of course, very much present in the uh, media uh, as uh, like uh, proofs uh, and uh, certain kind of uh, um, uh, argument in this international uh, claims of Ukraine uh, to condemn uh, Russia and, its, uh, the, and the way it leads uh, the war. And uh, uh, also, like notions of Europe is is present here, and uh, of course, parallels to World War II and Holocaust, and uh, use of term of genocide, which is of course uh, um, overloaded and uh, uh, debatable, probably in this context, but uh, very much uh, present uh, here in uh, Ukrainian situation, and uh, uh, also relatives uh, who are present in media. Uh, they uh, voice uh, not only uh, these uh, um, ideas of uh, civility and Europe and values, but of course also the uh, pain and uh, kind of individual uh, histories of suffering, but also preoccupation with identification and bureaucracy and uh, in general uh, like practical uh, possibility to do something about the corpses of their beloved ones. And uh, uh, once again, referring to this uh, uh, and trying to look uh, beyond uh, only humans here, also uh, quite uh, typically also, I think, and, also, and uh, probably referring to the so many, like uh, uh, so many other cases in the past, uh, you can see uh, in the Ukrainian media reports on uh, um, like images of the enemy as being uh, totally uh, kind of dehumanized. So there is a uh, widely discussed uh, stories of Russians eating uh, Ukrainian dogs uh, and uh, photographs of uh, actual remains of the dogs uh, which were like, eaten. Uh, uh, and uh, this topic is uh, discussed, uh, which uh, 
probably sounds for you like a folklore scene, uh, but uh, in fact, it is discussed uh, both uh, in uh, terms of uh, something like ir irrational um, as uh, essentialized barbarism, uh, but uh, also in um, other pronouncements, it is discussed as totally like rational behavior of uh, the Russians because uh, uh, they have a very bad uh, supply of the food, and especially in the first weeks, uh, they had to uh, uh, somehow uh, find uh, this uh, uh, food themselves locally. And uh, uh, I think it's also quite typical for how uh, animals uh, are um, most often instrumentalized and uh, basically used in, in this discourse and in this uh, discursive struggle. Mm, and also I think uh, this image of Ukraine is very much agricultural country and um, uh, impact on uh, global uh, system of food supply is uh, also discussed in the connection to this and uh, quite many photographs of uh, dead uh, animals uh, like pets, but also agricultural uh, animals from the farms. Uh, also are circulated. I just don't present them here. And in general, I hope I will not uh, hit uh, your uh, sens sensibilities to, too much by my presentation. So I uh, avoid uh, representing here many of, of the images which are circulating in media and especially in social media. And uh, I think that's also something interesting for us to discuss, uh, to which extent we can do this research now and uh, to which extent even my presentation could be taken as uh, relevant if I don't really show you um, uh, the very uh, like harsh content of uh, uh, dead bodies and how they are dealt, uh, dealt with uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, okay, and uh, also big topic I think is um, uh, a bit closer to this uh, psychological or psychotherapeutic uh, discourse of uh, of the death is uh, a discussion about the practices of glaring at uh, enemies' dead bodies, and I think several uh, psychologists have publicly very widely voiced uh, uh, their opinions that um, uh, actually uh, it's uh, quite healthy to look at uh, dead bodies, uh, at least at their images. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there are so many, uh, for example, telegram channels and uh, uh, like uh, some other places where you can uh, see the whole collections of uh, decomposing uh, bodies. And uh, actually, uh, there are several explanations. Uh, for example, mm, uh, this could be a kind of meditation, uh, and this could be a way to cope with uh, seeking revenge. And also, it uh, could be uh, uh, I could be uh, for the purpose of uh, like just to feel that the threat is diminishing with every uh, next uh, killed uh, Russian soldier, as it is uh, explained. And also, uh, I think quite interestingly explained uh, by uh, a journalist, Katerina Yakovlenko, uh, who also explains uh, uh, about her feelings as she's sitting under the rock, under the uh, rockets uh, strikes, uh, how she's uh, perceiving uh, and uh, how she's uh, actually looking through the images of the dead, uh, of the dead um, uh, Russian soldiers and how it uh, became for her a mix of euphoria and anger. And uh, of course, some other people are uh, worried about uh, uh, their guilty pleasure uh, to uh, look through the images of the dead and uh, in our oral interviews, for example, this problem is uh, uh, discussed from time to time that people are worrying about their uh, kind of uh, humanness and uh, in general, uh, their uh, self-image is uh, challenged by, by the fact that uh, they enjoy uh, watching or uh, glaring at, at the images of the dead. Mm, and uh, also, I think in these Telegram groups, it's quite interesting also to see how very special kind of creativity is uh, present in uh, these um, uh, channels with uh, collections of images of uh, dead bodies. 
uh, for example, um, different ways to create uh, memes, uh, uh, dark humor, scenes, uh, collages, uh, um, and uh, I think people are playing not only with uh, images uh, uh, themselves, not only with recordings or photographs, but they are also playing with the bodies themselves, uh, as some videos show. And I also think that this is a kind of, yeah, quite uh, morbid, uh, but also quite uh, probably typical um, for the digital age and how uh, this new sensibility is being formed uh, through uh, like social media. Uh, so some like I mean, when people start uh, doing certain things and start to improvise uh, with certain things uh, precisely because of uh, this intention to post it online and how this actually uh, special media uh, changes the, the situation on the ground. And also, I think very important um, uh, like uh, uh, way this images uh, in uh, Telegram groups uh, work. I think, uh, for example, here you can see a collage uh, which uh, presents uh, the photographs uh, of uh, wives uh, of the killed uh, Russian soldiers uh, from social media. And I think uh, so many people are engaged uh, not only on uh, in uh, cyber attacks, because uh, uh, you know that every school kid in Ukraine is already, or even kindergarten kid is engaged uh, at least in uh, cyber war against Russia, if not uh, into real war. Uh, so here, uh, so many people and also investigative journalists uh, are engaged in uh, tracing uh, certain uh, Russian soldiers, especially those who committed uh, crimes, crimes against humanity. And uh, they uh, take this information and photographs from uh, social media. And uh, here actually, uh, this is a collage of the uh, widows of the, of the killed Russian soldiers who receive uh, financial compensation. Uh, for for the dead and also I think uh, sometimes uh, like some uh, crowdfunded um, um, money and actually one of the big uh, intentions I think both uh, in official news media and also in uh, like many individual activists or um, uh, public opinion leaders uh, is. Uh, to prove uh, that uh, uh, there are no uh, good Russians, so-called. Uh, so uh, this idea that ordinary Russians uh, are equally guilty as uh, Putin himself. Uh, and uh, I think um, uh, this uh, attempt uh, to uh, purposefully prove uh, that uh, uh, losses uh, of uh, the close ones in the war uh, do not lead to um, uh, uh, rethinking of uh, uh, brainwashed uh, uh, kind of uh, ordinary Russian people. And uh, uh, I think this is uh, also a very like, big and important process, which uh, leads uh, to the construction of uh, this imagined community of uh, post-Soviet countries or Ruski Mir, uh, Russian world, uh, or uh, like Slavic unity, which is promoted actually by, by Putin. Uh, and uh, I would uh, say really in uh, Ukrainian media, I think, uh, of course, for, for everyone now, it's clear that Putin is uh, evil, but uh, uh, to prove that ordinary Russians are uh, also evil and uh, their relatives are also uh, guilty and are also engaged uh, in uh, what is going on, uh, uh, this is one of very like clear, uh, clear intentions. And uh, probably this is... Um, like uh, super important for for the country which uh, where people have so many family ties with uh, russia as well as with other um, uh, other post-soviet republics uh, just to uh, psychologically alienate uh, from uh, from this kind of imagined uh, community and uh, for example uh, many images which are circulated in telegram channels are uh, images like uh, these two, uh, which combine uh, like photographs of uh, from social media by uh, of, of Russian soldiers uh, with uh, uh, quotations uh, from their uh, social media, where they clearly state uh, their uh, anti-Ukrainian hatred or chauvinism or kind of pro-Putin position, 
which of course also functions as a proof uh, that ordinary uh, Russian soldier is uh, very much like uh, uh, guilty. And uh, I think it uh, it also something similar to uh, like uh, to reflection on uh, many other wars when first uh, you think uh, of uh, of the guilt of uh, the highest command but also then you should have a discussion of uh, individual complicity uh, which is uh, much more uh, complicated and i think uh, it's also quite interesting to think if uh, this discussion will also impact uh, our understanding of uh, ukrainian participation in the second world war for example for us also to understand that uh, and the same uh, like ordinary soldiers uh, we all engage not only in struggling against fascism but also in uh, many other uh, scenes which are all which were also part of of that war mm, and uh, uh, i also think uh, that uh, uh, it's quite interesting how um, investigative journalists uh, try to trace uh, this individual russian soldiers and expose them specifically as individuals and uh, social media once again give um, give uh, very like broad opportunities for this and uh, for example uh, so many everyday life details taken from uh, photographs on social media are used are in instrumentalized uh, to prove uh, that occupants are mostly come from small and deprived industrial towns in Russia, uh, how they lead very primitive lives and uh, how they are, of course, very much Putin, uh, Putin worshippers. Mm, and, uh, 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 of course, uh, it's also a part of ongoing process of uh, the Russification in Ukraine with uh, demolitions of uh, Pushkin monuments, uh, etc., etc. So this is probably this part of this uh, bigger process, which could be maybe called uh, decolonization, but uh, it's also probably debatable. And uh, last but not least, uh, this ecological discourse, uh, which is uh, mm, um, um, also, I think, uh, uh, coupled uh, with uh, uh, a nation uh, nation building or probably a kind of uh, uh, very traditional uh, traditional national 19th, 19th 20th century discourse of uh, nation and uh, soil or nation and landscape and um, uh, here also some images of uh, that bodies in Ukrainian landscape uh, which work as a uh, kind of illustration for the debates about the uh, uh, kind of uh, chemical uh, impact of uh, dead bodies on uh, nature and soils. And uh, on the other hand, this idea of fertilizer is uh, very much present in everyday uh, communication, I think. Uh, whereas, of course, in the professional discourse, you have a very uh, like radical uh, uh, criticism of uh, negative impacts uh, of uh, that corpses, the composing co corpses on um, uh, ecological situation and degradation of, of the soils. Mm, uh, and I also think, uh, once again, this new technical means of photographing, because you can see here, basically, I think photographs from drones and from some other like military equipment, they give you this opportunity to um, uh, make this uh, like very um, broad uh, images of uh, corpses lying in the, in the landscape. And... Uh, uh, also, I think part of it is uh, uh, this, uh, uh, once again, self-representation of Ukraine as an agrarian country, which partially is, is true. Of course, Ukraine is also industrial and also post-industrial as, as a kind of multi-layered scene. Mm, um, but uh, I think in general, this uh, idea uh, uh, and this presentation of uh, opposition tractor versus tank is very much present and uh, the self-image of Ukrainians as peaceful uh, nation which uh, tries to uh, sue the, uh, the fields in, in spring and the uh, Russians who are coming with tanks is also kind of very uh, functioning metaphor for this situation. 
And um, uh, I think also a part of it uh, is a discussion of bodies of Russian soldiers who stayed in Chernobyl zone for quite a while because for some reason, no one knows why uh, they started to dig uh, super deep trenches there in Chernobyl zone. And uh, uh, as it is reported, many of them died uh, just because of like super huge uh, doses of radiation. And uh, this is also a part of this uh, kind of uh, more uh, discussion about uh, uh, biological and ecological aspects of the problem. And also I found it quite uh, special, uh, the discussion of this problem in connection to um, the topic of uh, burying minks in Dania during coronavirus times. And uh, um, uh, that is uh, quite uh, telling, I think, uh, as well, how uh, the negative impact of uh, Russians that uh, corpses uh, are actually parallel to, to uh, burials of animals. And just to sum up, uh, so I think uh, um, one of uh, like my important insights is uh, that basically practices of representation and uh, uh, watching or glaring or uh, experiencing uh, somehow uh, enemies' uh, dead bodies is uh, functioning as a deconstruction of uh, this imagined uh, post-Soviet or Slavic or Russian-speaking community, and uh, also the construction of this opposition between good Russians and uh, bad Putin. And uh, also, uh, I think uh, uh, quite interestingly, uh, uh, to uh, quite interesting uh, how uh, we can interpret. Uh, connection between um, like official news media and how they function today and uh, its connection with uh, uh, unofficial uh, channels uh, such as uh, social networks and also oral interviews, uh, which uh, of course impact uh, one another and how these uh, different media uh, use uh, one another and uh, become uh, like uh, quite powerful uh, in, uh, interconnecting uh, different uh, scenes uh, through the kind of intermedia intermedia uh, circulation of uh, certain stories and uh, and images and narratives and uh, uh, of course uh, here we should also think about who are the administrators of the uh, social media channels and groups and uh, uh, how we can also interpret individual oral histories and to which extent uh, they interact also with social media and official media. And uh, I think it's all uh, quite uh, quite interesting to, to observe and uh, how uh, basically uh, new communities are built uh, around uh, not only our own dead, but also around uh, enemies to dead bodies, and how people meaningfully self-reflect uh, 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 because of these dead bodies and how they uh, probably renegotiate uh, their own belonging and their own understanding of uh, like their belongings and their communities. So thank you for uh, your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, this was this was really um, fascinating, and I know that um, you have to leave us at exactly six thirty our time. So this leaves us um, just under twenty minutes for discussion. Um, maybe while the others are collecting their thoughts, I'd like to, to ask a question myself. So um, I know that some of the the representational practices that you have shown us are actually quite controversial, right? So even um, when at the very beginning you showed us these images of uh, sort of symbolically resilient objects, right? Such as this kitchen cupboard. I mean, I know that, uh, for example, your former doctoral advisor has been very vocal on social media in saying that it's unethical to show this image uh, because it could be traumatizing to you know the people who lived in that apartment 
uh, and the same goes for other for other images of that kind, even if it's only objects or you know physical destroyed spaces that one is showing. Another example is um, images and videos of prisoners of war, which have also circulated quite actively on on social media, and where once again uh, a number of people have said that it's unethical and it might even be uh, you know illegal and and against uh, international conventions. Uh, to show these images, to, to show these images and videos of interrogations, so um, I'm wondering if you could say a little more about the pushback that um, some of these types of representations may be getting, may be focusing especially on images of, of dead bodies. So, is there any significant opposition in Ukraine? I'm not talking about you know international uh, discussions, but in Ukraine. Uh, against these kinds of, of ways of, um, in a sense, dehumanizing the, the bodies of dead enemies. <coughs> yes, yes, thank you so, so much, Misha. Misha. I think, I think that, uh, of uh, course, course point 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 into the very, very core, core of, of the problem. problem. And we are we constantly struggling with, with uh, the issues in our practice. And uh, uh, I even I know even that uh, some, some people condemn them to uh, our initiative to work on the history in general. This is a situation because so many people are traumatized and uh, probably, uh, probably uh, there is a there risk, is a risk that we will uh, uh, traumatize them once again in our oral interviews, even in spite of the fact that we do not address, uh, I would uh, admit, we do not address uh, directly this, um, we do not ask uh, actually uh, specifically about uh, death, uh, about uh, some super painful things. But of course, all these topics just emerge if people are willing to share them. And uh, uh, for, for some uh, colleagues uh, in the uh, oral history community, it was uh, even problematic to start recording uh, oral interviews now, but we tried to defend our position and uh, uh, to say that, uh, uh, of course, uh, we try to, to balance and uh, uh, not to prioritize our uh, scholarly intentions uh, before the uh, before the like uh, uh, risk of uh, um, uh, double traumatization of of the people, and actually in our interviews we even focus uh, more on everyday life changes, um, uh, understanding uh, and feeling of uh, um, uh, urban landscapes uh, back in the native cities and here in in the city of Lviv where people are staying now, and also our partners abroad they are interviewing people who are completely safe. And uh, they also do not address uh, that super, uh, like, well, uh, super kind of uh, difficult questions. And uh, of course, we also constantly work with the psychologists who are supervising not only those who give interviews, but also those who collect the interviews. So our group of interviewees is also constantly supervised because uh, also hearing to, to these uh, stories is not uh, so easy. And uh, as for your uh, very good point that uh, so many of the images are uh, so um, kind of unethical that there should be some pushback. And uh, of course you are right. And even I think in official uh, circles, for example, Alexei Arestovich, who is a spokesperson for Zelensky for the president's office, for example, he is uh, constantly uh, highlighting that, uh, like uh, when he's reporting about, uh, for example, the number of uh, dead enemies, he always uh, highlights, like first he says, there are good news, like another 200 Russians dead, but then he corrects himself uh, saying, uh, sorry, not good news because the death of any human being is very bad, but these are effective news. So uh, I think uh, even in this um, kind of official, very uh, official media, there is a convention that uh, uh, like uh, Ukraine, the essence of Ukrainian struggle is still sticking to uh, human rights and international law and uh, kind of uh, civilized community values, which uh, of course uh, uh, do not, uh, uh, which of course uh, share kind of uh, basic you know, human values, whatever uh, this means. And uh, I think also personally, people are very much uh, reflective of, of this and also these uh, discussions about renamings of the streets and, uh, as I mentioned, all these demolitions of uh, Pushkin, Dostoevsky, etc., etc., Tolstoy, 
uh, Horky, uh, etc., is uh, very much also uh, discussed. And the voices are quite uh, diverse, and uh, so many, so many uh, like public opinion leaders, uh, they really say that we should rather uh, preserve uh, objects like this just to be more self-aware of our own colonial heritage and uh, kind of uh, uh, imperial syndromes. And uh, yeah, in general, I think, uh, of course, uh, there is a question uh, uh, for how long um, uh, this situation will be like this, or maybe we will see further degrading of, of uh, this discourses to dehumanization. And uh, especially, I think uh, one of the turning points was when the uh, atrocities uh, uh, directed at the civil population were revealed informally occupied territories and of course after that uh, so many people they report on kind of their own personal degradation so the uh, hatred uh, and the feel of re uh, seeking revenge uh, grew uh, just enormously after these uh, atrocities against civilians were, were revealed uh, in i mean uh, specifically kiev and chernihiv region but I'm afraid we will we will see more more of that when when other regions will be liberated. For that answer, uh, Liv is raising her hand. Thank you so much for this uh, interesting and uh, uh, important presentation. Um, I was wondering. Uh, when you were sharing the interviews uh, of how people engaged with images in different ways uh, of the dead enemy, and I was, and, and how they talked about it as almost therapeutic. Um, I was wondering, there was some reflection uh, around, um, there was some reflection on uh, how um, some people felt that this, I couldn't believe that this is something that I would do. Uh, but yet I do it. Uh, were there people reflecting even further? Because when I listened to that, I was thinking that on the one hand, I understand, or I, I think I can understand uh, why this might happen. But I also imagine that it could be not therapeutic, but harmful in the long run. Um, and I was thinking about the critique of, say, escalating uh, people, escalating views of violent pornography, for example, and, and what that does to you. Um, as a viewer. So was there any reflection on that or do you have any thoughts on that? Mm, yeah, it's yeah, really present, present in the, 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 the psychotherapeutic psych discourse and uh, uh, I mean as this expert, uh, experts uh, try to uh, bring this idea that uh, uh, like sometimes it's okay to, to look through it uh, over a cup of coffee and uh, sometimes when it's too much it uh, could be harmful for you uh, but uh, uh, I think also uh, like in general Mm, uh, there, is, there are like two uh, two approaches to this. So one approach is uh, is um, uh, more uh, dealing with uh, feelings of anger and pain and uh, kind of seeking revenge, and other discourse is more about uh, kind of positive program and positive uh, action for for a person who is uh, feeling uh, kind of a uh, uh, need to be positively engaged in this situation. And of course, many people just say that uh, uh, with the time um, going on, people are more and more engaged in some positive kind of activities, such as volunteering, uh, protection of, uh, of uh, evacuated people, of uh, temporary displaced persons, and different types of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. And uh, um, so people also connect uh, this feeling of uh, hatred and uh, pain uh, and uh, also uh, hatred to, to this uh, dead uh, Russians as uh, kind of positively positive emotions which are transformed into some kind of uh, positive action, as I think uh, uh, also some of our uh, interviewees uh, noted. So, of course, it's... Uh, probably also a part of a bigger expert uh, discourse on, on this impact on uh, human brain. And uh, yeah. 
Thank you so much. It was really incredibly interesting and moving. Um, I wanted to follow up on these two questions uh, and also Misha's question about the pushback because I, I know some of the kind of leftist discourses in Kiev uh, which um, have reacted to a lot of what's going on by saying that uh, there's also um, uh, this kind of de dehumanizing and understandable but uh, dehumanizing practices and uh, memes and humor in a way is the production exactly of what Putin wants. That in, in a way this is exactly this whole idea of denazification which he started with, right? Which at first was directed at certain battalions, then spread to the whole army, and now to the whole Ukraine. Like everyone is basically dehumanized. And, uh, and so the reaction which is dehumanizing, in a way this is like exactly, he can now say, you see? So is that this kind of pushback? I, I know only from private conversations with my friends in Kiev who are saying this. Is there any kind of public um, uh, voicing of that uh, view? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you so much. much. Uh, of course, uh, you, are you are right, and I think it's not only left left uh, circles, uh, circles uh, uh, voice, uh, voice like, like this. this uh, uh, basically, basically, even, even uh, uh, official discourse, this idea of uh, human rights and uh, basically contrast uh, between Ukrainian army and uh, Russian army in uh, their approaches to civilians and uh, how um, actually they uh, are dealing with uh, prisoners of war. Uh, basically, of course, uh, they try to present uh, like a positive image of uh, Ukrainian army. <laughs> Sorry, these are good news, uh, so uh, no missiles uh, will uh, uh, fly uh, into me at this moment, <laughs> so alarm is over. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so actually uh, I think it's, uh, of course, a part of this positive self-image of uh, uh, Ukrainians uh, that they try to claim uh, their uh, kind of uh, belonging to the civilized community of those who follow uh, human uh, human life values and uh, who actually stick to international rules uh, but uh, I also think of course uh, for so many people under these uh, circumstances uh, it's also true that people uh, try not to criticize uh, too much and uh, of course probably this uh, discussion is uh, is um, before us so we will we will need to think more critically about our own uh, behavior and uh, our own approaches probably in the future and we really hope that Putin will uh, leave this opportunity for us and will not uh, bring his denazification to the end. Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, I cannot, I cannot hear. hear. Um, so the question is, uh, you have shown some images of animals evacuated from cities, uh, so that mm -hmm. leaves space for identification. But are there some images of dead animals in the battlefield or uh, lands that also circulate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So the, the images image of animals are very much uh, circulating, and uh, I think probably in uh, some uh, like more Western uh, countries it would be impossible to circulate them. But, uh, for example, photographs of um, uh, mass deaths of agricultural animals is very much present because, once again, because of this agricultural image of the country and this uh, global threat of uh, hunger because of uh, lack of um, supply of agricultural production from Ukraine it's also very much connected and uh, also for example uh, zoos and uh, natural reserves uh, were very much attacked uh, by the uh, enemy 
and uh, so many animals uh, died or uh, suffered very much because of that. So those images are very much uh, circulating as well. And uh, also I think, uh, for example, uh, stories about uh, shelters and evacuation of, of pets, uh, they are also very much present and uh, uh, kind of also very human uh, stories of families and uh, like pets as family members. And uh, yeah, so they are quite uh, quite massive, I would say. So not only like individual pets, uh, but also just a super super massive um, like photographs of uh, masses of of dead uh, animals. It's uh, really yeah. I decided not to include them into my presentation. So yeah. Or should we should we stop now? Uh, I, hope I hope we will we be, able be able to continue, continue tomorrow, tomorrow and, and uh, probably with some generalized, generalized discussions, discussions as a result of the whole event. event. Okay, so, so um, we'll leave you then. Um, thank you very much and, um, and very much. indeed it would be great if you, could, um, if you could join us tomorrow as well and we could continue the discussion. Uh, maybe after the second lecture tomorrow. So, uh, um, yes, but Irina unfortunately has to leave um, because of a, a family engagement. Um, so, once again, thank you very much uh, for this for this lecture. Thank you for being with us.